bothers me to remind you all that if you want to go to the Lexington Counterclocks game on Tuesday, June 13th at 6.45 p.m., she needs $17.50 from you today. So if you're going to that, be sure and get that money to her. Uh, also, uh, be filling up your baby bottles for the blessings uh, for the avenues for women. Those come back uh, before Father's Day or on Father's Day. So be filling those up. Um, on June 11th, in our evening service business meeting, Tyler Pruitt, our, our uh, KBC Owen County uh, church planner, will be here to answer any questions about that particular outreach. So be here <coughs> on Sunday evening, June 11th, for that. Coming up on <coughs> July the 1st, we're going to have our annual free yard sale. Hope it's cool. We're going to be inside. Right, okay. okay, it's going to be inside. So, you know, we'll yeah, have our still hope it's cool. Still be cool. <laughs> but listen, don't bring your stuff <coughs> until the week before. Okay? So it'll make it a whole lot easier on everybody to just wait till the week before, or the last week of June, to, to bring your stuff for the free yard sale. Uh, if you're on the stewardship committee, there's, there's no meeting today. That's been postponed. And last but not least, our on-campus outreach is today. 5 p.m., be here. You're, you're here to help us set up. Uh, if you've got any extra family-oriented outdoor games, you can bring those along and we'll make a spot for you for that. Um, I know it's going to be hot. And not everybody likes hot. Some people like <coughs> air conditioning. We need help for people on the inside where the air conditioning is too. Okay? So, um, you know, we'll do a little cooking and so forth. So, uh, be out here tonight. That, that runs from 6 to 8 p.m. tonight. So, there's no evening service. We're going to be putting feet to our faith tonight. So, reaching out to the community. So, come on out to that. And I'd like to introduce to you one of the finest fellows I know, Ed Stewart. He's going to come up here and, and share some scripture with us this morning. Boys, what it is, is uh, put John chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But before reading it, though, I'd like to thank Dorothy. Uh, she took me down to Columbia, South Carolina to see my son Andrew Stewart graduate from Grace Christian Academy. She's a graduate of Temple Christian Academy in Redford, Michigan. And my son Ed, uh, last Sunday was just a day of just wonderful. Because my grandson at school has had an influence. He was working the door. It was a greet already. And I think I'm hoping he'll pick a Christian field. But well, we sent him to Christian schools, and boy, it was painful to, uh, financial, but it was worth it, though. So today we're going to read First Peter, uh, not First Peter, but First John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Do you realize what that's saying? One day we're going to have a body just like his body. It won't be flesh and blood to be flesh and flesh and bone, a glorified body. That's right ahead of us. That truth is so great it just fills me up, boy. That's why I look at <coughs> how bad that the no like day is going on out there. It doesn't bother me because I know ahead of me I'm going to have a glory. And you're going to have one too if you've been born again and saved you under the blood. We shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. It won't be looking like him, looking like yourself, but it'll be flesh and bone, a glorified supernatural body. That's right ahead of us. It could happen today. And every man that has this hope in him purifies, even as he is pure. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And we know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. 
Folks, I want to pray this morning, Lord, that everyone in the sound of my voice has this great hope in their heart like I do, Lord. I know it's going to be after from this light of present with the Lord. And one day, I'm going to be like 33 and a half old, because now I'm 90 now, actually. I'll be 90 this year, and, and Lord, it's clear to me that one day I'm going to have a 33 and a half year old body like my Savior, Jesus Christ. A supernatural body, Lord. And I'll be working with him throughout the kingdom age. For a father, this is a hope I hope everyone will grab hold to this day. I pray for Pastor as he comes today, Father. His word may come and have free course, Father. Save some man, Lord, <coughs> who don't have this hope before. It's a hope that just overwhelms me, Lord. The future is like a shining light as compared to all this horrible stuff going on. Like we're living in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. But boy, we have a hope, Lord. If one day to be a supernatural body like the angels, well, what a day we have ahead of us, Lord. So I pray for those that are here, Father. I pray for Pastor today as he comes. I pray his word, your word may go forth in great power in our hearts and minds. If someone would accept Christ today, that they could be filled with this blessed hope that you fill me with, Lord, that we know that one day we're going to live in heaven is our home. Well, I ask this in Jesus' name, Father, save the lost. Save that man or woman who's never made the greatest decision in all of life, except Christ as their Savior. Before we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs>
great thanks for the opportunity to come into your house. And Father, we just pray that these tithes and these offerings, Father, be multiplied for your glory and our good. And we ask it in Jesus' name.
that button. What else, Tom? Uh, this has been brought to you by uh, Free Trial. Anyways, um, uh, I want to real quick, uh, we want to honor uh, someone. Uh, many of you all know it's uh, graduation <coughs> time. And we have three graduates from our church. Um, um, one of them is, is here with us today, and that is, of course, uh, Miss Rebecca Vaught, whose list of accomplishments and things, um, my hand hurts from balloon animals, so I didn't write them all down. So basically, if there is a scholarship you can get, a school that will uh, accept you, she's gotten it. So um, um, uh, with that said, we want to honor Miss Rebecca. Come over, we got a gift for you. Washington and Lee, William and Lee, I'm Catholic, Washington and Lee, yes, that's where she's going, fortunately not in the state of Kentucky, uh, she did consider the University of Louisville, so there's always that backup plan, but really congratulations, it's amazing, you so thank you so much. Thank you. Well, with that, go ahead and grab your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans 10. Uh, we are, uh, Lord willing, next week we'll finish our study on the resurrection of Jesus. Remember, our goal is, is to say, okay, if the resurrection is the center of our faith, why don't we talk about it? And why don't we really think about how it shapes our faith and, and everything uh, in it? And Don, I, I forgot to say, I do have a PowerPoint. Uh, it should be ready to go. Uh, Romans chapter 10. <coughs> Uh, that is uh, page uh, 1007 of your pew Bibles. We want to read two verses. With that, if you will, stand with me out of road. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Maybe one of those passages you had memorized as a child. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, I ask, as always, that you would open our hearts and our minds and our eyes and our ears, our mouth, our hands, and our feet, that we would go in obedience to Christ. Transform us uh, so that this world can be transformed and your kingdom come. And give us the assurance that only faith, love, and hope can give. In the name of your glorious Son, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Many of you all may know, uh, yesterday was the expo, and uh, this is the first time we've been able to do the expo since my first year here. It's been eight years since we had the expo, and uh, I love the expo. It's one of my favorite uh, events that the city does and that we, we participate in. Our goal this year is to have on-campus events like we have today at 6, off-campus events like we did at the expo. So next month we'll have the art sale, we'll have uh, uh, some, some other family outreaches and whatnot. We've got other things planned as well. The goal is, is to reach our city with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, we, had, we had, if you want some numbers, we had 67 people register yesterday with us. Of those 67, about 30 of them either asked for a follow-up, I think that was 16, or wrote down specific prayer requests, about 14. Uh, that's pretty good. So about half the people are asking either we are interested in uh, uh, finding out more about your church or are in a uh, have great needs from depression to uh, community issues to family issues to to other spiritual needs. And uh, particularly our prayer team will be focusing on those uh, tomorrow. But with that said, uh, I, I was asked by several of the people who were making fun of me. I mean, they were teasing me. Uh, for being a preacher that made balloon animals. My fingers still hurt from all of that, uh, tying those little balloons and everything else. And so I thought I would bring one to you. Is, is that okay? I'm going to show you a balloon animal. Uh, this is a snake. Okay? Now I made this balloon animal like Wednesday or Thursday. It's a snake. And so I know what you're thinking. We knew that when we brought that guy from Owen County, he was going to turn us into a snake handling church. Well, today's the day. We become a snake handling church right here, you know? Um, uh, it reminds me when I uh, went to a church out in eastern Kentucky many years ago, and uh, as a joke, our host uh, grabbed a first aid kit. We asked, what's the first aid kit for? And he said, 
He's a snake bite, right? And then didn't, didn't smile nothing. We just went on. We're like, oh, <laughs> we made a mistake. We're about the annoying county photo. Anyways, the, the, the thing uh, about yesterday is, is we made hundreds, or we, we try to make hundreds of, of balloon animals. Probably didn't make hundreds of balloon animals between all of us. But there was one problem we had. We, we ended up running out, not because we weren't prepared, but because so many of them popped, and we made so many. The thing about balloons, what makes them great, is they're easy to fashion, they're easy to, to shape and, and, and whatnot, and they are a huge hit with kids. Um, uh, our hands hurt from, from constantly having to make swords and snakes and flowers and butterflies and axes and hats, and that's all I can make, and, and, and everything, right? Uh, kids love it. You know, a sword is a balloon sword is the one thing you can give a child, and no one panics that they have a weapon. Right? You, you give a bunch of brothers swords, and they're whacking each other's side of the head, and no one thinks anything of it. But although there's advantages of those balloons, there's some real disadvantages of them. For one, they they easily pop. It was over 90 degrees yesterday. It was hot. Fortunately, we were able to stay in the shade uh, with our covering, but it, it got hot. And, and if you, if you overinflate a balloon, if it, if it were to fall on a single blade of grass, we've had that issue in the past. If, if, if the smallest prick pierces its thin skin, it will pop. Leave it out in the hot sun. Leave it in your car right now. And what you'll find, you'll go back and begin to shrivel and, and be a shell of what it once was. Balloons are very fragile. In fact, at one time yesterday, uh, a train went by, um, and the whistle was loud, but our response was not, hey, a train is going by, but rather, I popped another balloon. It was so loud. Balloons are fragile, and they are that by their nature. People are like that, too. We are fragile, we are easily wounded, and we are prone to question the unending love of God. And as a result, one of the most pastoral issues I've dealt with for 20 years is this need of assurance. We need assurance. How do I know that God still loves me today? How do I know I am still welcomed into his army? I don't know what translation you have in front of you, but I'm willing to bet that they all agree on a single word here. Is at the end of verse 9? Do you confess your mouth, Jesus, Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? You will be saved. That word will, of course, is in the future tense, which is odd when we think about salvation. To think of it in the future, this is exactly what it is that Paul is doing here. You will be saved. And we can take that future in two ways. For one, it could be a prediction. It will rain. Uh, my party will win the election. My team will win the game. Or we can take what I think is what Paul means to be not predictive, but prophetic. If I promise, for example, my children that I will do X, I go to the ball game, I'll, I'll, I'll be here for lunch, or you and I will go and do X. I am not making a prediction. If everything lines up, and, and then I will make you a, pro a priority. Rather, I'm making a promise. That is to say that if aliens were to invade, I'm still going to take you to the ball game. If there is a 20-car pile up on my way there, I will find a way to fulfill this promise. If the University of Louisville finally win a basketball game, yet I will still fulfill this promise I've made for you. So, too, Paul's pronouncement, you will be saved, is not a prediction. I believe it is a prophetic promise. Because in the Bible, the promises of God are often put in the future. In doing so, we see that they are future made, or future uh, uh, given, but still are uh, present. They are right here and right now. That is to say that the promises of God are so certain they can be confirmed and affirmed as if they are ours now. You see, the secret to assurance is a fuller understanding of Christ's work as a result of the empty term that procures salvation, that is the result of grace, and comes 
from his finished work on the cross and the resurrection. To do so, what we need to do is to get a fuller understanding of what salvation is. And because often we, we, we shorten this. What does it mean as the Bible presents it? And we need to understand the three tenses of the Bible. First of all, the Bible tells us we, uh, that should be, uh, we were saved. Forgive me for the typo. We were saved. And this is the issue of faith. Let me show you Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result, so that no one may boast. Notice, you have been saved. You were saved by grace. Now, when we think of salvation, we think of our redemption. This is usually what comes to mind. And, and, and that's good, but it's limited. And whenever we limit to salvation, to what God did for us in the past at youth camp, vacation Bible school, that one Sunday morning, or in the privacy of our dorm room, whatever it might be, we, we think of salvation as a past event. We imagine ourselves a drowning in the ocean of sin, and God dives in and rescues us. And we think, yeah, I got saved. But, but what happens later on in life is, is, is uh, the, the, the doubts and fears and guilt and shame and everything else conjures uh, or it shows up in our lives. And as a result, we think, well, God saved me. He jumped in and saved me before. He's not going to do it again. After all, he got me out of the water and he said, stop swimming in the ocean. And he went on with his life. And then I had to figure out the rest of it myself. That is the error we make when we only see salvation as a past event. Maybe you're here today and you don't remember the moment you got saved. Or maybe you felt pressure to walk the aisle. Maybe you felt you were a little too young to fully understand grace. Or maybe you wonder if it was even genuine. Since then, you've made mistakes. You've fallen into sin. You've wandered away from the faith. And as a result, your hope of assurance has been pricked. The heat of life is withering away your assurance. But when it comes to saving faith, there are two great dangers we make here. The first is we buy into religion. Religion tells us that salvation is tied to both rhetoric, say the Lord's Prayer, say the sinner's prayer, whatever it is, or and or ritual. Like baptism, or walking the aisle, or, or doing this or that. And without those things, you can't have assurance. But the problem with that is, religion never can provide assurance. Because how do you know you said the prayer right? How do you know you uttered the words correctly? How do you know that you were faithful enough? How do you know you've gone through the motions and all the ritual? You can keep citing the words, you keep doing the rituals, but you will never know if it is enough to procure the loving salvation of God. Or we can buy into postmodern spirituality. Given our culture's distrust of institutions, most Americans, when asked what their faith is, they would usually check the box that says, not religious, but spiritual. This, of course, is a convenient term because it is so ill-defined. Can you tell me what it means to be spiritual? Neither can they. It could mean that you've decorated your kitchen with angel figurines. They were on sale, so it's okay. Maybe it means that you pray to the wind or to some distant deity. You don't even know if that deity, he, she, or it, even hears you or even wants to hear you. But it makes you feel better when you do it at the graveside of someone you, you, you love and lost. What does righteousness look like in such a fluid state? Who determines if you are living righteousness? righteousness? This is the problem with spirituality. But what you'll find with this claim of spirituality is rarely any deeper than fickle feelings and emotions. And you will never find assurance with your fickle feelings and emotions. There are some days my wife agrees that I am the greatest thing that ever happened to her. That happened one time. <laughs> there are other days she is trying to see if there's a loophole in our, in our uh, criminal law that would allow her to kill me. Our feelings, our emotions are fickle. And if your faith is rooted in fickle religion, or fickle spirituality, you'll never have assurance. 
The gospel is rooted in history and faith. Christianity is not a set of ideas or doctrines, though it has those. It begins with, his, with an historical account. Either they happened or they didn't. And Christianity isn't interested in saying, like, well, it's myth, but hey, it makes me feel better in the morning. Rather, it is to declare, if Christ is risen from the dead, you and I can know death is a conquered foe, sin has been washed away, and the head of the serpent has been crushed. The key here is the issue of conversion. Again, it isn't ritual or rhetoric. It is conversion. And uh, gospel conversion is rooted in three propositional truths. One, I am a sinner beyond help. I am drowning in that proverbial ocean, and I'm not a good swimmer. In fact, I'm sinking. Sinking, and I will drown. Secondly, it means that Christ was crucified and risen from the dead historically, not myth, but history. And that act of death and resurrection procured for me salvation. Thus, I can't save myself, but there is one who can. And thirdly, if I believe in his finished work upon the cross in the empty tomb, and I repent of my sin that sent me into the ocean by which I am drowning, I will be saved. That is the act of conversion. Notice here that conversion is not a spiritual tune-up. Think about it. If, if you were to go to Kroger or somewhere else nearby and buy a magazine, I can almost tell you what is on the front of it. Five ways to woo your man. <laughs> Ten ways to get that six-pack. Your wife will never take her eyes off of you. Six ways to pretend like you were listening in the sermon but weren't. Whatever it might be, right? We, we, we love tune-ups. We love simple fixes. If I just follow this path, then I can quickly, maybe even today, change my life. And often we approach our faith that way. That's not what Jesus does here. What he's not offering in the gospel is not, come to Jesus and here's six ways you can finally pay off your bills. That's not what conversion is. It is not a tune-up. It is divine rehab, uh, rehabilitation. I can't talk. Only God gives this new birth. It is received by faith, trusting in the grace of God who works in us. So the question as it relates to salvation and assurance comes not from, did you go through the uh, uh, motions of salvation? But rather today, have you been converted? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you been saved? So we, not, we see not only in the Bible that salvation is past tense, rooted in faith, it is present tense, rooted in love. We are being saved. Let me give you just two passages. I can give you a dozen, of course. Let me give you two. The first one, 2 Corinthians 2. We are to God the pleasing uh, aroma of Christ among those who are being saved. The same thing is said in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only my presence, but much more my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation. That sounds like it doesn't belong in the Bible. Because we rightly understand salvation isn't rooted in works. Here, Paul is saying is work out your salvation. And that's why it really context works in our reading of Scripture. Paul is not presenting your works righteousness, but rather the work of God in the lives of those who have received Christ as Lord and Savior. There, there's a stereotypical, uh, a stereotypical uh, scenario that, that I think I've joked about this before. That let's say a couple's been married 20, 25, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever. Inevitably, if, if they do this, it was the wife's idea to say, honey, let's have another wedding where we can renew our vows. Does he want to have another wedding to renew his vows? Barely I say unto thee, no. He really didn't want the first wedding. He just wanted the girl. And the wedding was the means to get the girl. I mean, that's 
<laughs> that is true. I know. I, that's fire and brimstone right there for some of y'all. But but so 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 she wants to renew her vows, right? Now, in saying, honey, I would like to renew our vows for our 50th anniversary, is she saying, honey, I feel like after all these years, you don't love me anymore. No, that's that's not what she's saying. Is she saying that, honey, after all these years, I don't love you anymore, and I need to I need to have another wedding, right? No. This, 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 this new wedding isn't so that they can get married again, as if they lost their marriage. But rather, it is to, 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 to rekindle a love, to reaffirm a love, not that had been lost, but that had been present for all those years. It was to again publicly to say, God has been good to us. I love my spouse. My spouse loves me, and we want the world to know it, and we are recommitting ourselves for the rest of our lives. That's the point. You're not getting married again. You're not signing the documents again. No, but you are renewing it again. Why? Because love is not duty. It is delight. Whenever you first get married, and hopefully still now, you, 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 don't, you don't sit down together and say, we got to go on a date night. It's been weeks. Your mother gets on me when you complain to her that we haven't been on a date night. You don't do that. Right? A few weeks from now is youth camp. I'm not going to youth camp for the glory of God. Why? Because we get a week without the kids. A week without kids. You see the, the, the light in my voice, right? My wife wanted to come to me and say, hey, were you thinking that maybe we should go out to eat? Yes, we should go out to eat. No kids. That's like half off right there off dinner already. I mean, you, you had me at half off. So it is with the Christian journey. You come to faith through religion, and you'll find your faith is duty before long. You're not very dutiful with it. But if we've been rescued and redeemed and transformed by Christ, we will fall in love with the Savior. The key issue here, you're going to get out late, the key, key issue here is discipleship. As Christianity began to spread among ancient Rome, you know, it, it was uh, quite a while before the word Christian was invented. The term, the main term that the believers were called was not Christian, but disciples. Let me give you just three examples from the book of Acts, just so you know that I'm not lying when I say that. You see, the Christians understood that, yes, you were saved, but at the same time, you are being saved. And this is the act of discipleship, of learning, of growing, of becoming more like Christ. Can I give you just two areas that the disciple shows up as it relates to our assurance? The first area is disciples bear the fruit of faith. One of the easiest ways to test that the Holy Spirit is working in our converted hearts is to see if we are bearing the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you just two passages here, Matthew 7, where Jesus says, Good trees bear good fruit, bad trees bear bad fruit. Didn't know if you know that or not, but that is a fact. If, if, if you grow an apple tree, don't get disappointed if you don't get pumpkins from it. Don't raise the backer and wonder why it don't taste like corn. Good tree bears good fruit. Bad trees bear bad fruit. So it is with our faith. Can you look at your lives and say, if it's if you reference Galatians 5, that I can look at my life and see God work in my life producing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? Not perfectly, but progressively. You can look back in your life and say, you know, I may not be what I should be. I may not be what I could be or ought to be, but praise the Lord, I am not what I once was. And notice here, it's not fruits of faith. It is the fruit of the Spirit. You see the role that love plays in here. That we, motivated by the love of Christ, put on ourselves the love of Jesus that manifests itself with these fruits. You see here, this isn't about ritual or feelings. We can test the work of the Spirit in our lives. And we look to see God at work. Have we been converted? The second test that we can have is that disciples practice the spiritual discipline. We do not bear the fruit of grace by accident. We don't simply wake up one morning and find ourselves to be more joyful, to be more patient, to be more meek. We, we, it doesn't happen that way. Sometimes I wish it did, but it doesn't. Rather, fruit must be cultivated. And we cultivate the fruits of faith through 
uh, reading and meditating on scripture, regular prayer, corporate worship, confession of sin, fasting, skip that part, generous stewardship, gospel witness. We cultivate the faith. The logic is simple. The people of God, converted by Christ, will seek their Savior. Think about it. Your marriage will suffer if you do not cultivate love. And this is why we encourage date nights, movie nights, uh, communication. When my wife and I first got married, what we got for a wedding gift was season one of ABC's Lost. I don't remember anything else we got for our wedding, but I remember that DVD set. And the advice that came with it was simple. It was actually the guy that married us. Uh, you've met him before. And he said, you will be too poor to go on fancy dates like you did. When you were in high school and you, you, you worked all those jobs and you had all this money, you had no bills, those days were over with. Fix dinner together. Sit down and find something you can share together. To us, it was lost. To you, it may be WWE Royal Rumble. I don't know what it might be. <laughs> to this day, I encourage couples. Look, it, you, you will live off of love for the rest of your marriage, whether you're rich or poor. Cultivate that love. To us, it's watching lost. To this day, we, we're always in search of a show that we can watch. I couldn't care less about the kids' happiness. What we <laughs> want to watch. This is our time. If you're not cultivating love, your marriage is doomed. If you're not cultivating love, your discipleship is doomed. And you cultivate it through the spiritual disciplines. And maybe you're here and you realize you, you've not been following Jesus in your life. Can I, can I just ask you to consider two things? One, were you ever converted to Christ in the first place? I'm not asking did you go through the motions, did you, did you read the right books, did you say the right prayers, all that stuff is pretty good. But did you surrender your life to Jesus? Maybe you're here this morning and these doubts and fears and concerns have, have been haunting you for quite some time. And, and, and let me ask you, have you really given your life to Jesus? The second thing I, I would like for you to consider is that God is a loving father who will, who will invite prodigals home. Maybe, maybe you did surrender your life to Jesus, but you went off with the Gentiles and are now feeding pigs. There is a father far richer than that farmer you keep chosen, who will feed you not slop, but at the king's table. Will you come home and find the loving father who will embrace you and lavish you with his love? And I guess finally, again, you're not getting out on time. Finally, we will be saved. We will be saved. We were saved. We are being saved. We will be saved. This is the issue of hope. It's right there in our text, isn't it? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can. And isn't this the day we all wait with glorious anticipation? We long to hear the words of Christ there upon his throne. Well done, good and faithful servant. The issue here is hope. If salvation in the past is rooted in faith, Salvation in the present is rooted in love. And our salvation in the future is rooted in hope. And the good news is, God's love is not a fickle love. God is not sitting upon his throne with a daisy in hand. I love him, I love him not. I love her, I love her not. Can you imagine how heartbroken I would be if I discovered my children went to bed every night wondering, their father still loved them. What sort of father would that make them? So too, dear loved one, if you have been saved, if you are being saved, can I share you with the hope? You will be saved. The father's love is an unending, eternal love. Beyond what we can fathom. So much so, he gave us his son, who bled and died for us, was raised to assure us that we have his love. Well, four years ago, the New York Times published an interesting article. It was regarding the safety deposit boxes at your local bank. The article
article basically argues that although we assume that if we put our things in safety deposit boxes, it is likely they are secure, but it is no guarantee that they are secure. The article tells the story of a man named uh, Philip. I won't try his last name. He was a man who collected watches. We had a former pastor here who was world-renowned for his watch collecting, or the third pastor, actually, second pastor. And this guy collected rare watches and become more of a hobby. He actually made quite a good living in it. So he got him at his local bank a safety deposit box and put some of his most valuable watches in it, totaling millions of dollars. Years later, he went back to get that. Come to find out, when he opened it up, all the watches were gone. <coughs> As of 2019, New York Times tells us there are 25 million safety deposit boxes in banks all over the United States. They are often used, it says, to store diamonds, rare coins, stacks of cash, and other valuables. Phillips said in the article, quote, My impression about safety deposit boxes was that it was like you were putting things in Fort Knox. Nothing could happen to it. The article goes on to state, he doesn't think that anymore. Well, it just goes to show, doesn't it? Nothing in this life is secure unless it rests in the hands of the risen Savior. Nothing in life is secure except that which is in the arms of God. Isn't that what Jesus told us? John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me. If you read here, you can see the past, the present, and the future of everything Jesus says. My Father has given them to me. He is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Very beloved, if Christ is risen, and you surrender your life and converted to Christ. The good news is you can rest tonight in the arms of a loving Savior. Your salvation is as secure in Him as anything else in this cosmos. Have you surrendered and given your life to Him? And if not, what is keeping you from doing? Maybe you're here and you've been wrestling with this very serious spiritual pastoral issue. I want to ask you again, would you not come and receive once for all the assuring love of our Heavenly Father, rooted on the resurrection of Jesus? Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would be so kind as to help us to wrestle with this. This is a very pastoral issue, a very important spiritual issue that often we uh, it haunts us and we don't address it. But Christ, give us the assurance that only you can. Move your spirit in our lives that we progressively come more, become more like our Savior. For those who are lost here today, we ask that you will convert them by the movement of your spirit. For those of us who have received Jesus, we ask again through the movement of your spirit that you transform us into the image of your Son. As we all await the day of death and judgment, give us the hope found only in the empty tomb. Christ is risen, and one day so shall we. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Give us what only you can. Secure our faith as only you can. And move us in this time of invitation. In your son we pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.